Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to Truth. It is a blessing and a privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray that you are excited about coming back into the Word today. I'm just, um, I'm always in awe of God and what He's doing, especially when I spend time in His Word. And here's the thing. If you're not spending time in His Word, please commit to do so. Don't try. Commit. Because it is so critical to be feeding your soul. Because here's what I know to be true. We make pl- we, we set out plenty of times throughout the day to make sure we feed our flesh. But never do we really make a conscious effort and a committed effort to feed our soul. And so as we come into this time, even as we look forward to Thanksgiving coming in a couple of weeks and so forth, I just want to share just briefly back from where we were last week is that we're talking in a little mini series of called talking about our purpose. Our purpose is, as we learned last week, is to make disciples that make disciples. And the beautiful thing is, is that many of you remember that Matthew 28, 18 through 20, or, or where it says, uh, go you therefore and make disciples uh, of all nations, right? And so if you read it in the original language, it actually says it this way. As you go through life, make disciples. Do you get it? That as life happens, as you're going along, and here's the thing. I'm not talking one along with a track in your hand. Talking about if you die tonight, where are you going to go? Okay, I grew up hearing and seeing that kind of track ministry. And I guess at some point, maybe it works for some. But here's what I know to be true. Most people you run up to with one, you don't know them Two, You're asking them about a very personal thing about where will they spend eternity? And why would I answer you? Right. Because here's the deal. Jesus walked past Matthew in the tax collector booth. He didn't say if you die tonight, where are you going to go? What did he say? Follow me. When he was building his, his disciples, right, the 12 disciples, when he walked by the, the seaside there and they were fishing, right, and they were with their nets and their boats and so forth, he didn't walk up to them and say, if you die tonight, where are you going? What did he say? Follow me. There was an investment in time that was going to be required because he needed to earn the right to what? Right on their heart. He met them where they are, by the, where they were, right, by the way, right? He didn't drag them to where he was. He walked by to where they were at. He went into their pathway. Did he not? This is where I want y'all to get this piece because as we come to the second part of our our purpose little mini series message, if you look with me over in the Luke again, Luke chapter 10 around the 30th verse, I'm going to talk to you about what it means to meet someone in the point of their need, but also to be in their pathway. And this is where Jesus is dealing with the uh, um, one of the Pharisees of the law. He's questioning Jesus in this matter to say, who is my neighbor? Right. And I love this because Jesus could have said any number of things because he asked him the question. The the, the lawmaker first asked Jesus was this. How do I gain eternal life? And he says, first, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy body, all thy soul, all thy strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he swole up and said, well, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Right. Oh, oh, I love this. So if you have it with me, Luke chapter 10, starting at the 30th verse, say amen. You have it. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. And it reads this way. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. And so to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, verse 33 says this, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity upon him and he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. This is verse verse 35 says this. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Verse 37, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do Likewise, let us pray. Father God, we thank you for another wonderful day, God, that wasn't promised to us, Master. We pray now as we prepare our hearts and minds to go further into this service, Lord, that you would come and be a part of this 
um, experience with us, Father. Father, we thank you for those that pressed their way to be a part of this experience, Master. And Lord, you know that you are our Master and our Savior and our Redeemer, and we'll be forever careful, Father, to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen? Amen. 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 This morning's sermon title is called Meeting the Need. Meeting, excuse me, their need. And at the top of your outline, you will find the words, Meeting the need. And it says, meeting the need is enabled when we walk in unconditional love and enter into the pathway of someone who has a need in their life. And instead of turning away or talking about them, we use what we have to address the need without expecting anything in return. And I just want to welcome you once again this morning. I am super stoked because here's the thing I know. This is how I feel. This is what I know to be true. God is good, right? Do you agree with me that God is good? Yeah. You see, because, you see, I can't help but to give him praise. I start looking back over my life. I start looking back over last week. I start looking back over all the things that I've gone through, and God has met every single need and more. Come on, somebody should say something. You so, and so I know that he didn't have to bring me into this new week, and he didn't have to do any of that. He didn't have to do that for any of us, but he did. And he also met all of us this last week, and even at the beginning of this week, at the point of our need. Whatever that need, he's already met it. Come on now. And so somebody should say something. Because see, many of us know the parable about the Good Samaritan. And as we come to the second part of our, our purpose uh, little mini-series, the illustration found in this parable couldn't be better. It deals with the issue of life happening, ready or not. But it also shines a light on how the people of faith view and even sometimes treat those we encounter. Because see, whether they are lost, which is what we're called to go make, we're called to go out into the highways and byways and reach the lost, right? But then there's also those who have fallen, who knew God and knew Christ and have fallen into their faith, right? Fallen in their faith, but also the failing. Do y'all get that? There's three stages of people, the lost, the falling, and the failing. Okay. And at any given point, we, are, we, look at like, we look like each and every one of those steps. Before you know Christ, you're lost. After you know Christ and you've gone away from the word for a while and so forth, you're falling. And then after you've gone, and when you're failing in your faith because you're not continually to keep yourself fed in the truth of the word, then you fall into the failing category. And so we're called to come along and touch each and every one of them. That's our purpose. And so this is why I get excited. Because, see... The interesting part of this parable is the stereotypes and the role reversal. See, the key blessing is that is that we see an excellent example of how to meet someone at the point of their need. Each and every one of those needs a lost, falling and failing. Because, see, in verse 38, Jesus shares that everyone will have a need. And listen to how he says it. He just introduces it so calm like. He says in Jesus in, in reply, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, when you hear that, you don't hear like everybody has a need, do you? But listen to this. The road this man was on was a 17 mile journey, which was known to harbor robbers. Right. And they would hide along in caves and along the way and attack their victims. But even if this road didn't have its known history of trouble, here's the, what's unique. Trouble and problems are never far from mankind. Somebody should say something. Job writes this in Job chapter 14, verse one. He says, a man born of a woman is of a few days and full of what? Trouble. Right? And so here's the deal. Whether a person is lost, their soul is lost, they've got a need. Whether they're hungry, they've got a need. Whether their mind is troubled, they've got a need. Whether there's been death in their life, they've got a need. I want you to understand, everyone has a need. Come on now. And it's in verse 30b that we see that the thief comes without warning. And it says this, and when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Do y'all get it? Now, I want you to realize the person in this story that this parable is telling is, is most likely a Jew. So there's a Jew leaving Jerusalem, going down to Jericho, making this treacherous journey down this road, and he's attacked. Evil falls upon him. And here's the key part. What is interesting about this part is this parable is that the thief or the robber came without warning. Also, the man wasn't doing anything to create this situation to happen to him. Do y'all get this? Trouble comes ready or not. 
But nevertheless, the tragedy fell upon him. So we can't stop the thief from coming, but we can walk in the abundant life in Jesus Christ. Jesus shares these words in John chapter 10, verse 10. He says this, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. He says, but I have come that you might have what? Life and life more abundantly. Somebody should say something, right? Isn't this good? It's good. And so as a child of God, we should know this better than anyone. And because we know this and because we have this love of God in our hearts, we should be one of the first to offer aid to somebody in trouble. Somebody should say something because see, here's the deal. We're the first to talk about it. But are we the first to offer aid? You see, but it's in verse 31 that we see sometimes we miss church on the way to church. It says a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Do y'all get that? Do you realize we're talking about how do you reach the harvest? You got to go into their pathway. That's how you reach the harvest. You got to go into the pathway. So and otherwise we will miss the divine appointments God places in our pathway if we're not willing to engage in them when they come. And so by simply looking the other way, we miss it. Here's the deal. It's not like he didn't see the man. Mm -hmm. He just didn't want the issue. Right. Come on now. Mm -hmm. But one must ask the question, why didn't the priest stop and help? What happened to loving your neighbor as yourself, right? What happened to, to, to being what God called you to be, right? So he was a religious leader and should have set the example, right? He's the priest. Shouldn't he have set the example for others to follow? But whether it was fear of being robbed himself or being seen associated with someone who was in a fallen state, he missed the opportunity to write on a heart. Do y'all get that? He missed it for whatever his outside concerns or situations was. He missed the opportunity for the Apostle Paul shares in Philippians chapter two, verses three through four. These words do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. For each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of what others. How powerful is this message? Right. But it got, you got to die to self in that position. But Paul shares these words in Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. He says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Verse 10. Therefore, as we have what? Opportunity. Let us do good to all people. Do y'all know all means all and that's all that all means? It means believer, non-believer, whatever, whatever especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And often what is illustrated at the head of the church is mirrored, by the way, in the body. Somebody should say something. Because come along, looking at verse 32, we see the body. So to a, so to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Now, could the priest say anything to the Levite now? Because he passed by? Could the priest call the Levite out? He can't. He just did the same thing. He set the example. Right? So he's not going to call him out because then the Levite had any presence of mind. He'd go, well, didn't you just walk past him too? But you see, the Levites were responsible for taking care of the tabernacle and assisting the priest in their ceremonial duties. Right? So if you want to bring it to present day time, it'd be elders and deacons as those people, right? And so this is the second time in this parable that Jesus makes reference to the religious failing to help someone in need. And here's the deal, we got so many churches, especially some uber goober big ones, right? Where are we meeting the needs of those in need? I got this one article that keeps floating around that keeps showing up on my timeline on so my social media things about this one church that paid out $7.8 million worth of uh, hospital debt, which was beautiful. But shouldn't we have more stuff like that? That'd be great, right? But here's the thing. I found in scripture where Jesus deals with the religious who failed to meet the needs of those who encou they encountered. Jesus shares his words in Matthew 25, verses 42 to 45. He says this, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. 
I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Verse 44. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Verse 45, he says this. Then he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Do you get it? See, the Apostle Paul shares it this way in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. This is the piece you've got to keep in your mind. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. See, too often we don't like the person. And we're not called to like everyone. We're called to love them. And we're called to be Christ-like. We've got to remember, we're talking about what our purpose is. Too often we think our purpose is to show up at the church house and sit on a pew and sing a few songs and give our tithes and our offerings and go back home. Our purpose is so much more than that because see, that's just the surface level stuff that you get when you show up in service. Whether it's a Bible study or choir rehearsal or whatever, the true work is in the streets. It's in the harvest fields. But here's what I know about God. He always has a ram in the bush. Somebody should say something. And see, and once again, he proves that he has no respect of a person because in verse 33, God uses an unlikely ram. He says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. Now, do y'all realize what's important about this? Couple of things. One, a Samaritan normally wouldn't have taken that road way in the first place because it's a dangerous road. Second of all, because he's Samaritan. Most of the Jews made that travel, that path. Okay? So Jesus now introduces a Samaritan into the parable, and Samaritans were hated by the Jews, by the way. Okay? They were viewed as half-breeds, and Jews wanted no dealings with them. Okay, so now we got some racism issues going. Okay? But notice the Samaritan came to the man and showed what? Compassion. So if the, here's the deal. Here, here's where it gets so beautiful. Jesus asserts here that unconditional love knows no ethnicity boundaries. Somebody needs to say something because, see, he could have been in his feelings about how people felt against him because of his skin color or his nationality or whatever and left the man humped up, clumped up, beat up on the side of the road. But he doesn't. See, I'm talking about our purpose this morning, right? For I'm reminded of Jesus' interaction with the woman, Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, verse 9, where it says, And then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, right? But here is the key piece. Jesus says this in John chapter 13, verse 35. He says something about his disciples. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Somebody needs to say something. Right? What have you gained to love somebody that loves you? Nothing. Nothing at all. Do you realize that when they crucified our Savior... He was praying for them, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they are his enemy. They're the ones killing him. Right? Do you remember in the Garden of Eden when, when Peter pulled out the sword and whacked the dude's ear off? And he says, Peter, what are you doing? And he puts the ear back on the man. He says, do you not realize that I have the ability to call down angels from heaven? This is not what I was called to. See, this is the deal with love. Love endures some things. Love suffers long. It speaks of this kind of love, right? And this is what makes this so juicy. It's because whenever God says love, it is always in action. It's never lip service. It's never lip service. Too often we want to give lip service as our love though, right? But Jesus shares in verse 34 a that his love touches a life. Somebody need to say something. You see, because it says this, and he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Do y'all get this? This that was uh, what we call early man's uh, first aid kit. 
all in wine. Probably carried in just a small little samples just for situations like this where you get a cut or whatever. Little, okay, but let me break it down what the all in the wine meant in this scenario and why he put it on in the order in which he did. The oil soothes the wound. Do you realize that this man was concerned about his comfort? And then he broke out the wine for the disinfectant to kill any germs that may be in the situation, right? In the wounds. And I love this because the Samaritan didn't care what the outside world looking in thought about him or even the situation. Too often we're caught up in worrying about how people are going to view us when we're reaching out to help someone that's in a low place in life for whatever reason. Do y'all get that? We care more about our own prestige than, the, than our purpose of what we're called to do is to meet people where they are and earn the right to write on our hearts and minds the truth of God's word. You see, the Samaritan saw a need and he stepped up and he met the need. But he didn't just stop at taking care of his wounds. See, he didn't leave him on the side of the road. Do y'all get that? He didn't throw the little first aid kit to him going, hey, hook yourself up. Good luck with that. He didn't do any of that. He cared about the man's safety. And it's in verse 34b that we see him bearing the man's burden. He says, then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. Do y'all do see this? You see, the Samaritan didn't just bandage him up and leave him. He took on the burden of the fallen man. Do y'all get that? He knew it was going to cost him. Do y'all realize the Samaritan in this parable was on his way going someplace? And he gave up going to where he was going to at the moment to meet the need of someone he did not even know. Do y'all get this? Do you see how powerful this is? Because, see, it'd be different if it was somebody he knew and he stops going where he's going and come back and helping. He's helping someone and otherwise that would probably spit on him if he was healthy. Wow. Do you see the love? Do you see the compassion? Do you see the mercy? Do you see all these things? This is what Christ likeness looks like. Perfect example. Because you see, he not only provided him with first aid, but he put the man on his donkey. So that meant that the Samaritan had to walk when he was tired. Couldn't ride. How many of you going to give up your car and start walking? To help somebody else ride. Mmm. Quiet in here. You see, he took him to a safe place, by the way. He took him to the inn. <sighs> took care of him without expecting anything in return. Do y'all notice that he didn't ask the man, what happened to you? What did you do to bring this up on you? He didn't ask the man. He didn't chastise him. Isn't that beautiful? Because oftentimes for us, for us to help anybody, we won't know what the sorry so-and-so did. Right? Because we never think about that there's enough of the person, whether they did wrong or not, that still needs to be salvaged. You see, do y'all realize what he was doing in all of that? The Samaritan was earning the right to write on his heart. Do you think that if the Samaritan had any message that he wanted to deliver after this man was well, do you think this man would have been in a position to hear him now? Mm -hmm. Why? Because he met him at the point of his need. And beyond. And beyond. Come on now. Woo! Woo! See, do y'all realize the testimony the Samaritan has this morning? And see, most of us by now would have said, at this point, I have done enough. Right? I didn't bandaged up his wounds, didn't put my own self at risk. I didn't put him on my donkey and brought him back and put him in an inn. I didn't spend a day with him. Many of us would have said, I've done enough. But look at what Jesus shares in the illustration in verse 35. It says, then the next day he took out two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him. And he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. 
What do you see here in the Samaritan? I see he invested his time by staying with the man a day. But I also see he invested his money. Huh? And to have others look after him until he was well. But then also the Samaritan, he also committed to what? Follow up. He didn't say I was going to try. He committed to follow up. Do you realize that when God is doing something, he is always committed. He's never trying. And when you consider the action of the Samaritan and those of the priest and the Levite, which one looked like Jesus Christ? Oh, see, that's the beauty of this. See, I'm talking about our purpose this morning, right? And, and it's because Jesus asked that exact same question in verse 36. He says to the, the expert of the law, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Mm-hmm. Say it another way. Who met him at the point of his need? Mm-hmm. It was the one who showed him mercy. You see, if all we have is faith, but our faith has not manifested itself into an outward expression of works and love, then our faith is dead. James says it this way in James chapter 2, verse 17. He says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You see, we're called to be imitators of Christ. And if all we are is an outer shell of what Christianity looks like, then our faith is not real. Somebody should say something. And this is what Jesus was teaching the expert of the law. See, here's the deal. The expert of the law, he had all of the head knowledge, but none of the heart knowledge of God's word. And that's many of us. We can go back to the original language. We can quote scripture. We can do all this. We got all of this head knowledge, but no heart knowledge. That's why I always say that the greatest journey in a Christian's life is 18 inches. It's not from the birth canal to the grave. It is from the brain to the heart. 18 inches. Whatever you know in your mind, let it make that journey down your brain stem to your heart stem. And it actually changes your life because you live out of your heart and not so much out of your head. Because you never find him saying, hide my word in your head. It's always in your heart. It's always in your heart. (laughs) Let's close this out. And in verse 37, Jesus checks to see if he, if the expert in the law learned anything from the parable. Listen to what he says. The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. So I guess he learned something, right? And so Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You see, here's the thing. You notice that even after the parable, the expert of law still couldn't say the Samaritan was the one that met, the na- met his neighbor at the point of his need. He, can you imagine being, because he's, he's, got, he's got ill will in his heart towards Samaritans. Because he's different. His ethnicity does not pass his, his test. His test, not God's test. And he probably dryly said this to Jesus, the one who showed uh, mercy, because that's us real good. When we're caught up in the truth and we got to speak truth, even though we don't agree with truth. Because I want you to realize Proverbs 14, 21 says this, he who despises his neighbor sins, but blessed is he who is kind to the needy. See, if we want to meet someone at the point of their need or restore the fallen and failing, then let us commit ourselves to this, loving unconditionally. Being willing to go into the pathway of the lost, the fallen and failing, and to meet their needs while on this road to living blessed. This is our purpose. Let us pray. Father, I thank you once again for another beautiful day that wasn't promised, Master. I pray that all that was shared here this morning was accepted on my side. I thank you for these that pressed their way to be a part of the experience. I thank you for those online. God, just use us mightily. Challenge us, Lord, in this that we call our purpose. And God, let us grow and let us continue to be useful to you. Let us be of silver and gold instruments in your great household, Father, for we don't want to be of wood and clay. 
because we want to be for usefulness and for showing off and for showing out in your name. And so, God, we just praise you and we thank you. We ask these blessings, Master, in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name. And we say together, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. Love you. Take care. Stay safe.